Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Arab Spring, four years later. My name is Josh Craycraft. I'm one of the program directors of Primary Source, and I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. Uh, for those of you who are new to Primary Source, we are a nonprofit organization in the Boston area that seeks to advance global learning in K-12 schools. We do this in part by offering online and face-to-face -face professional development courses to teachers and by hosting webinars such as this one, which are meant to offer knowledge, tools, and strategies. Uh, for teaching global matters of pressing importance. As many of you know, today's webinar is the third in a three-part series on the modern Middle East. In January, we heard Professor Peter Krause of Boston College explain the Islamic State. And last month, we talked with journalist Christina Asquith and Kitam al Kaikani of the U.S. Institute for Peace about the lives and experiences of Iraqi women over the last several decades of war and change. This last webinar was recorded and is available for viewing on our YouTube channel in case you missed it. I'd also like to add that in addition to programs on the Middle East, Primary Source also provides professional development opportunities and resources for teaching U.S., Latin American, African, uh, Asian history, societies, and cultures. Uh, today, of course, we're going to be talking about the quote-unquote Arab Spring and assessing from the vantage point of four years down the road what this label has come to mean and the impacts that these movements have had in the Middle East and North Africa. I'd like to begin by saying a few words about the format for today's talk. Our guest speaker today, Barb Petson, will start the evening with 30 to 40 minutes presentation, after which we'll be taking questions from teachers in the audience. There are two ways you can ask questions tonight. If you have voice capability and would like to ask a question, uh, please click the little hand button on the left, which will virtually raise your hand and let Barbara and I know that you'd like to ask a question. When called upon, please click the talk button at the top and speak in range of your mic. And when finished talking, please also remember to hit the talk button again to turn off your mic uh, so that we don't get a lot of the background noise. Alternatively, you can also type your questions in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. We do anticipate lots of questions tonight, and we'll try to get through all of them as best we can. Finally, we also know that there's much to discuss about the modern Middle East, and we ask that your questions today remain focused on Arab Spring and teaching the Arab Spring. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our guest discussant today, Barbara Petson of Middle East Connections. Barbara has a BA from Columbia in International Politics and Middle Eastern Studies. She then went on to Oxford, where she studied on a Rhodes Scholarship, and eventually returned back to the U.S. to do her graduate work in History and Middle Eastern Studies at Harvard. She has since devoted much of her career to helping Americans understand the Middle East. She's the former president of the Middle East Outreach Council, and is currently the director of Middle East Connections. She's also the creator of the Middle East curriculum on our shared past in the Mediterranean and has worked on a number of primary source courses and materials related to the Middle East. So thank you, Barbara, for joining us today, and please feel free to begin when you're ready. Okay, well, thank you so much. Let me quickly click away from that, click away from that horrible picture and um, uh, uh, dive right into um, the topic of looking back on the Arab Spring from a vantage point of four years on. And I think uh, one of the first things I want to talk about when we talk about the Arab Spring is that term itself. Um, when we talk about the Arab Spring, of course, it, it has this sense that, um, you know, spring is a time of hope and optimism and it's all, you know, it's leading forward into uh, a summer vacation of leisure and happiness and barbecues and whatever. I mean, there's a sense that um, the Arab Spring is something that inevitably leads toward um, a brighter, uh, progressive future. And looking back, that's clearly not exactly what has happened in the region. Um, but even at the time, I think there were many of us in the field who were a little bit unhappy with that designation, the Arab Spring, and would be more happy with something like the Arab uprisings, for example. Um, but even that, I think, is, is interesting because um, there were a lot of other things happening in the world at the same time. For example, the 99% movement in the United States and in Spain and other places um, uh, just after the Arab Spring started, uh, we had the Gezi Park protest in Turkey, um, and those aren't Arab countries either. So I think that um, Arab Spring is, um, you know, we all understand what it means, but I think it's important both to understand 
that the idea of springiness is a little bit controversial um, and misplaced perhaps in retrospect. Um, and also that if we only look at these things through an Arab lens, um, we may also miss some global connections that I think are very interesting to explore. So, you know, you might do something with your students, for example, on having them compare what was happening in the Arab Spring and what was happening in uh, the protests on Wall Street in the United States or, or in Spain, for example, um, at exactly the same time. And what kind of uh, um, goals did they have in common? What kinds of issues were they about, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that being said, I'd like to now take you back to uh, the end of 2010 and 2011. Um, there was this real sense of monumental change in the Middle East. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of the coverage that we saw in, from the United States, uh, from Europe, um, was extremely hopeful and positive and optimistic about this. Um, you know, obviously there was also um, nervousness about the instability that it might create, but there was a sense that this was finally the time of change. Um, I remember in, in, for those of us in Middle Eastern studies, it was fascinating because, you know, for decades, we had, you know, in graduate school memorized the list of Middle Eastern leaders and, um, you know, really we didn't have to do a lot of work on, on that list over the years because it was so stable. I mean, Hosni Mubarak was uh, in power when, you know, I first went to Egypt to do my graduate work um, in the uh, 1980s and he was still there. So, it, you know, these guys were, you know, had incredible longevity in the region, um, which meant for a particularly authoritarian kind of stability. And with the advent of um, the protests in Tunisia and in Egypt and then in Syria and Yemen, et cetera, it really seemed like um, that authoritarian stability was really going to be shaken. And when we were looking at these from the, the, certainly the perspective of the mass media, there were a number of characterizations, I think, that were commonly made about um, the uprisings. The first is that they were very much youth-driven, right? That um, while, of course, there were participants from across society, these were protests that were um, uh, primarily the province of the young, uh, which made a lot of sense in a very young region of the world, and we'll come back to that. The second attribute of these protests were that they were mass protests. So we had lots of crowd shots like this of, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, a million people in um, some of these protests in uh, Tahrir Square in Cairo, for example. And there was a sense from the media that this was an uprising of everyone in society. And I think that it's not to say that these uh, protests didn't have the support of um, a lot of people in Egypt, in Tunisia, et cetera, but I think it's also important to recognize that um, in a country of, you know, 70 or 80 or more million people, um, having, you know, 500,000 people um, participate is not like it's a majority. So it's, it's important to remember that in other places, outside of Tahrir Square or, um, you know, even a few streets away, things were a little bit different and we need to keep um, a little bit more perspective in hindsight than perhaps the media had at the time. I mean, the media, of course, is going to cover where the action is and that means that it's not always getting the broader perspective of those people who are perhaps a little bit unsure or nervous about uh, the kinds of upheaval that were happening in society. So as historians, we need to look a little bit deeper than perhaps the media coverage did at the time. Um, nonetheless, you had these very um, energizing, exciting demonstrations. Um, and of course, in Egypt, um, primarily very peaceful demonstrations. It was a, a, a peaceful um, anti-government mass protest that was, um, you know, really looked like it was this um, you know, nonviolent way to change, to challenge authoritarianism, uh, and in fact, it looked like to win. 
The other thing that I think was really interesting and important about these protests is that they were seen as primarily driven by technology. We called them Facebook revolutions and Twitter revolutions. Um, and it was very exciting to be able, you know, even when the internet was shut down, we were getting citizen journalism footage from people's cell phones um, sent by satellite out of the country and, and we would get them. So it was, it was very exciting because it felt very participatory because we were able to engage with people by looking, you know, uh, looking, going to the Facebook pages or watching Twitter feeds from uh, people like Sands Monkey and other major bloggers who um, were able to reach out in English to the whole world and um, make us uh, front row um, observers, if not semi-participants, in what was going on on the ground, and that was very exciting. I think one of the things that's interesting is to remember that while, you know, Facebook and Twitter and social media were important um, in these uprisings, um, the most important technology, perhaps, was satellite television, which before um, Facebook and Twitter really began to mobilize people, um, satellite television uh, gave people access to a much broader sense of, of what was happening around the world and allowed coverage um, from within the, the Arab world. Um, and that's one of the things that made this, um, these uprisings so uh, transferable from one country to another in these early stages because everyone was spending all of their time watching the television to see what was happening in all the other places. And it meant that it felt like something that was connected across the region rather than simply something that was entirely local. A couple of other things that I think are really interesting is that maybe because this was a revolution that we saw as being driven by young people, and by technology, we also thought that it was going to be secular and democratic. So a lot of the people that we saw talking were quite secular in their outlook or seemed Western looking to us um, and uh, seemed like they wanted the kinds of things that we had in the West and that we could share um, that. Uh, despite perhaps their political frustration with uh, the United States or U.S. policy, um, it felt like they were um, aspiring to a lot of what the West had to offer in terms of culture and in terms of democracy. Um, and again, that's not necessarily how it's played out in the long term. Um, so I think, uh, again, all of these uh, uprisings began with um, a catalyst that was a young man named Hamad Bouazizi in Tunisia, um, who's uh, was a vegetable seller, um, very poor, very frustrated anyway, um, and his vegetable cart uh, was um, destroyed by the police because he didn't have a permit or it was confiscated by the police. So he tried to go to the police station and complain about the way that the police had treated him and he was humiliated and got no answer to his complaint, which was, of course, very common when you're someone without any power or connections facing an authoritarian regime. And in an act of, of desperation and frustration, um, he set fire to himself um, in a, a square in, in Tunisia on the street. And that single act was the, the spark that set off this tinderbox of conflict and uprisings across the region. Um, and there had been many other possible catalysts um, Egypt was already teetering on the brink of um, mass protests uh, because of another catalyst. Um, so it's really important to see that the catalyst itself did not start the uprisings in a sense. That potential was there because the frustration felt by many people um, uh, toward the regime, its authoritarianism, the economic crises uh, that societies were facing. That was already there. But these catalysts began to set it off. So when we look at causation um, of the Arab uprising, you had these catalysts, not only uh, Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia, but for example in, in Egypt there was a blogger named Khalid Saeed who uh, was attacked by police at an internet cafe, um, beaten to death and horribly, horribly beaten. And uh, there were a lot of people who, um, you know, saw him be arrested, his family went to uh, get his body from the morgue when the police released it, 
and they took pictures of what had happened to him and, and posted them on Facebook. And that became a, his, his, um, this horrific picture of him battered by the, the state um, for political protest. And then the police came back and said, oh, he fell down the stairs, or oh, he was resisting arrest um, and trying to downplay what had happened to this man. Um, that became a real rallying cry in Egypt. And the Facebook page, We Are All Khalid Saeed, um, had tens of thousands of people joining it um, and, in a sense, um, pledging their allegiance to some kind of resistance to uh, the authoritarian regime. So you have these catalysts, but again, they were on top of all of these other social pressures. Uh, perhaps one of the most important is the demographics of the region. The Middle East is one of the youngest regions in the world, um, particularly in some of the countries where the uprisings happened in uh, Syria, Yemen, Egypt, for example, uh, Libya, all very young countries. Um, so you have a high proportion of people who are in this range of, you know, 15 to 25, um, when people are apt to be um, politically volatile, let's say. Um, so the problem is that you have all of these young people, and that should be a demographic gift, right? That should be um, a, the potential to grow your economy. For example, in the United States, um, we had that uh, boom, baby boom after World War II, and that demographic boom allowed the economy in the United States to grow enormously, and it was a real era of prosperity as those people came to aid, to, to maturity. Um, in the Middle East, however, um, certainly in the countries that have had these uprisings, um, there's been this huge population expansion, but with very little access to upward mobility. Um, people have education because the state has provided education. They have satellite TV, so they see what opportunities other people have, but they don't have opportunity themselves to have um, economic stability or to have fulfilling careers. So that uh, frustration was building up. There were also environmental causes. There had been a drought in Syria for several years. Um, there were um, uh, water crises in Yemen, um, lots of refugees in the cities uh, in Syria, for example, fleeing from the dried up countryside food crises, the price of food in Egypt uh, was going up and up and government subsidies um, were either being cut or there were threats that they were going to be cut. So people felt at the most basic level um, challenged that their, that their human um, um, uh, capacity to survive was at risk. Um, there were, of course, also um, the, the, the long-lived challenge of authoritarianism, um, that dissent had been brutally repressed, and the examples of the kind of repression um, of Khalid Saeed and uh, Bouazizi, those were the things that, that mirrored to people the kind of everyday repression of these authoritarian regimes um, so that they were really the straw that broke the camel's back, one of many, many, many instances of repression that anyone in these countries could have cited. You know, the inability to get a permit to um, have a new business if you didn't pay bribes to the proper people in power, um, the inability, you know, the, the access that people with connections had to jobs when no one else did. Um, and as I said, of course, technology enabled a lot of this. The, satellite TV, social media, allowed people to communicate without going through the state controlled media, um, even though the, the state tried at the beginning of the uprisings in every case to shut down um, people's access to social media, shut down cell phones, shut down uh, TV stations. Um, there was enough ability amongst the population to make an end run around the regime's control of the media that people were able to communicate, to connect, to tell one another when and where they were going to meet and have these uprisings. Um, and that really, the, the inspiration of one uprising to the others and the momentum that people felt because of the connection people saw between these uprisings um, really made things, uh, um, you know, gave them enough momentum that you continued to see people, um, you know, trying to uh, uh, have the same kind of uprising in different countries or to keep things going based on that sense that things are about to change. 
And then finally, just again, economics. It's related to demographics, but um, in Egypt, for example, the economy was growing at a reasonably good rate. The problem was 5% economic growth a year, for example, which you know we would have loved to have in the United States. The problem is that all of that growth was going to a very, very tiny layer of people on top of society. And that meant that there was a growing unemployment, um, particularly among young people, and particularly not just among young people, but amongst more educated young people. That is, the more education you had, the less chance there was that you would be able to find a job that fit your skills. And that meant that you had tech-savvy, educated people increasingly frustrated. Um, and you had a growing wealth gap between the people at the very top of society and then the majority of the population. So all those things come together with these catalysts and you have the Arab uprising. Now, um, one thing that I think is really interesting, if you want to track um, what happened in these uprisings, um, this is a, a great activity to bring your students into um, as historians, to have them go back and look at a number of different timelines that track what was going on in terms of these uprisings across the region. And again, as I said, you could also bring in um, the demonstrations that were happening in the United States on economic issues in Spain and in other places. Um, but even if you just look at the so-called Arab Spring Uprising, um, you can find a variety of different, very interesting interactive timelines. Um, this one is the um, one from The Guardian, um, but you also had one on Al Jazeera. The BBC had a timeline. Wikipedia has a timeline. What I think is very interesting is to look at you know, the comparisons of what was happening in what society along what timeline so that you can, as you can see here, very clearly see what um, effect or what reverberations particular events in one country might have had on another. Uh, but also, what's really interesting to me is to compare these timelines and to um, really inculcate skills of visual literacy and media literacy in your students by having them ask questions like, how are these events presented? So if you look at um, you know, The Guardian versus Al Jazeera, um, they're going to obviously have very different political analyses of these events. Are they rebellions? Are they uprisings? How much do they include people who are more Islamist versus people who are secular? Um, are they showing the same kind of people in the images that they use, et cetera? So how events are presented um, uh, in different, uh, from different media outlets is interesting. But I also think it's very interesting to look at how long they have these timelines going. Do they continue to go up to the present? Did they stop after 2012 um, so that they, in retrospect, decided that these uprisings only lasted one year? Um, you know, all of that. So um, how, how long the uprisings went um, on these timelines and what they include, what events are in and what events are out. Um, do they include, for example, what was going on in Bahrain and um, when the, the Saudi army came in to help quash the uprising in Bahrain? Do they include um, demonstrations in the UAE or in Saudi Arabia, for example? Um, so looking at how the different outlets approach it um, and what they see as being included in the uprising um, is very interesting and it's a very manageable project to really get your students to think about um, these uh, issues of how history is constructed um, out of media reports and how differing these media reports can be.